by the end of the course we will have a written exam uh, March 18. If you are failing this one you will have a second attempt on April 16 and if you fail one more time it will be in the end of August that the third attempt will be. Uh, any questions about the general setup for the course? Good. Uh, as I said, we will complete the book. We will take all the remaining chapters in the book. We will also hand out our own material. This is especially when it comes to data structure and algorithms. Uh, my lecture slides will be a bit more extensive, so they will uh, work as your uh, teaching material. <coughs> and the goal after the course is that you should have seen most features in Java. Java is an ordinary programming language and there are not that many features that you haven't seen yet. The one thing that we haven't talked about and that we will, will not talk about in this course are threads for how to run your programs in parallel. We will not discuss it in this course either. It will be the topic for a course that you take next year in the operating system course. But apart from that most of the features in Java will be uh, presented uh, in this course. And hopefully you should be able to construct smaller programs, about 10 to 15 classes to solve problems after this course. Uh, then it only remains hard practice for two more years and you will be professional programmers. But basically you should have seen all the features in Java after this course. Uh, the lecture and the setup for the course is similar to, as the previous one. We give three lectures, we take a short break and then we have a deadline for the first assignment. So the first assignment covers these three lectures. We have another three lectures, a short break with an assignment that covers these three. Two lectures assignment and two lectures and assignments like this. So uh, it will be four practical assignments. They are individual exactly in the same way as we did in the previous course. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have merged the English group and the Swedish group and it wasn't that successful because we must find a larger lecture room. Those who are looking at this video cannot see the, the chaotic situation here, but we are people sitting everywhere and a few of them are also standing. I apologize for the situation. Next time, come much earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's my best advice for you. Uh, uh, Anyway, the lectures will be Monday, not every Monday and not every Wednesday, but in general it will be Monday 1 to 3. That means this one is an exception where we are starting at 3 o'clock. In general, when we have a lecture on Monday, it will be started at 1 o'clock and Wednesday at 10 o'clock. They will all be recorded. We have divided all the students into three groups, uh, as usual. English group lecture, Swedish group lecture and Swedish group Kalmar and the remote students. They have all different assignment sessions where you can meet and talk to the teaching assistants. Yeah, we have the same setup when it comes to practical assignments as in the previous course. Four of them, they are individual and all, each one of them will be graded from A to F. Admission. Are you all admitted to this course? There are two steps in order to enter a course at LNU. First you must get admitted to the course and then once you are admitted you come and you get registered on the course. If you have been admitted to the course you will see it in LADOC. That means you have been admitted to it and then you should register yourself. Uh, and I will now take the opportunity when you are here to pass along a list. Uh, make sure that you get this list before the lecture is over. You should find your name and mark it that you have seen your name and, and that you are here. And if you go through all these lists and you can't find your name, then add your name and your Swedish ID uh, in the back side here. So I start over here. Yeah. Many of you have contacted me about the problem of uh, registering yourself using the online system. Have you tried? Yeah. Did it work? No. Do you know why it's not working? Yeah, 
Uh, the prerequisites for this course is the previous course and since we haven't corrected the exam and the fourth assignment none of you have passed the previous course so none of you are accepted to this course. Uh, so uh, the online system doesn't work so we will do it manually here so I will pass around this list you sign up and later on you come and talk to me or you go and talk to Eva Pulser and we will try to handle it in some way but most of you will be handled using this list. Yeah, so, make sure that you're admitted. Uh, you check that you're admitted by looking into LADOC. If you can find this course among your list of courses, uh, you are admitted. Registration, that's what we are trying to fix now. And also, uh, make sure that you have access to Moodle. If some of you maybe took this course last year, uh, then you are not automatically inserted into Moodle. Then you should contact me. You should give me your name, your Swedish ID, and your LNU username, and I will add you to Moodle. Okay? Uh, let's jump uh, to the topic for today, inheritance. Uh, inheritance is, I think it is rather straightforward inheritance to learn how to start using it but getting all the implications of it is somewhat more tricky but the basic idea is that we can create a new class by extending an existing class I will show an example where we have a very simple class called a book and then we uh, this one contains uh, properties for example pages and also a number of methods. Uh, this is our starting point. Now we can create a new class called dictionary. Dictionary. By extending this book. That means this we, are, we will say that uh, the class dictionary extends book. It will get all the properties from this one. And then we can add a few more properties our number of definitions for example. So we will be able to create new classes based on an other class. The new class will have all the properties, all the methods from this one and a few extra that we are adding down here. This is the key for inheritance. We are creating a new class based on another class. And since this one inherits all the properties from this one, we will often be able to treat this one it can do everything that this one can do, but it also can do a few things more. So whenever the program is expecting a book, we can also give it a dictionary, because the dictionary can handle all the things that a book can handle. So, yeah, we are saying that the new class, in this case dictionary, inherits from the old class book. Yeah, why inheritance? Well. Students, of, students often appreciate the fact that they don't have to write the same code several times. Rather than having a student, a teacher, classes that looks very similar and write the same code many times, you can just have a base class up here and then you inherit from it. You don't have to write the code many times. But actually, <coughs> more importantly is the second one here. Uh, inherit behavior can be used in the same way. If we have a number of classes that are connected through inheritance, we can treat them uniformly. We can treat whatever different type of books we have, we can treat them as a book. So we can have a collection, a list of different books. The first one is a dictionary, the second one is something else, but we can all treat them as a book. This is the key uh, property of inheritance and also <coughs> by introducing inheritance we are creating actually hierarchies I will show examples of it later on but we are grouping the classes together in a hierarchy and this is a good way of organizing things you just need to look at a class as at its position in the hierarchy and you will know a lot about it just based on its position but uh, <coughs> First of all, when should you apply inheritance? Well, quite often when you are designing a program, you start by trying to identify what classes that you, you need in your system. Uh, and then you are identifying a student, a teacher and things like this. That means many classes in the system 
person, employee, teacher, student, customer, they are they look very similar. They have similar properties, they all have a name and things like this. When you start to have a number of classes that are very similar, you should start to think about inheritance. Uh, it is a good way of simplifying the implementation, but also organizing your implementation. If you can take all these things that look similar and put them into a hierarchy, you're done basically. Let's take a look at the first example. Yeah. I have here the example that I just discussed, uh, a class book, an ordinary class, it contains a number, we are keeping track of the number of pages in it, we have two methods, get pages and set pages, a very simple class. Here I am creating a new class, dictionary that extends book, this is the keyword that's saying that we are creating a new book, a new class dictionary based on another class book here. And then we are adding a few more uh, members here. We keep track of the number of de definitions in the dictionary. We give a number of new methods here. Uh, so the class that we are creating down here or defining down here, it will have these properties, but it will also have these properties. So we are creating a new class based on the rules of another class that we have up here. So Later on we would like to use this class, we can create a new dictionary like this, we can set the number of pages to be 876. Here we are actually using the method up here from the book class. We are saying that the number of definitions should be 68,345 and then we are computing the ratio between definitions and pages and then we are printing it uh, here. So, the class down here is fully aware of what's up in here. For example, this method compute ratio, it says, it computes the, the number of definitions not divided by the number of pages and pages was uh, declared up here. So, uh, dictionary knows everything about book and adds a few more properties. So we have two more classes here at the price of only one basically. Do you get the basic idea? Yeah, a question over there. Uh, so if we create a data structure containing books, uh, we can add a dictionary? You have a data structure, for example, an array list uh, defined for containing books. Yes, you can add a dictionary. But not the no, not the opposite. Uh, uh, if it expects a book, the list in this case, uh, a dictionary will do the work. It can do all the things that a book can do. It can do a few more things, but uh, it can do all the things a, a book can do. So, uh, <coughs> details in the previous example. Uh, this is the keyword. In the class declaration, we are saying that our new class dictionary extends the class book. That means dictionary inherits from book. Uh, they inherit the, num the number of pages and it inherits the methods, set and get pages. Uh, uh, we are saying that book is a superclass and dictionary is a subclass. And sometimes we say book is the parent and dictionary is the, the child. I will often use superclass and subclass, but some people are using parent and child relation. Uh, one more thing, uh, in the example here I said that the pages up here in the book are protected. Up until this point we have only used private and public. Protected is something in between. Uh, protected means it is available for all classes that inherits from it, but it's not available from outside from other classes. Uh, so by making a field protected, you are in some way preparing yourself for inheritance. That means every class inheriting from this one can reach it in this way. And the same goes with method. It's not that common, but you might have methods up here that are protected. Then they can be reached from the subclasses, but they cannot be called from any other part uh, of the program. Uh, I'm adding more features. 
Uh, I'm saying that the class book also contains a field uh, called title and we have a constructor that looks like this and we also have a two string method so I added a number of members up in this one. Uh, it has a two string method that prints information about the book in the dictionary here. <coughs> I am uh, also inserting a constructor and here I'm using the keyword super. This means that I am initializing this class by using the constructor from the super class. So super refers to the super class. Down here I am creating a two string method and I do it by saying well okay the first thing to be printed is the two string from this one and then I'm adding also that the number of definitions is this one. So uh, super reminds you of what? This. This. this re by using this the object refers to itself. By using super it refers to its super class. So if you're in a subclass and want to reach something in the super class, super dot something gives you uh, access to it. Yeah, I think this is just a summary of what I just said. Uh, super, the subclass can reach the members of the superclass. Compare it with this, where an object can refer to itself. Uh, I'm using it two times uh, down here. No, I was using it in the constructor and here I'm saying that uh, when you are printing out the content of a dictionary, you start by printing the content of the book part of the class and then you're adding a few more things uh, down here. Uh, other rules for inheritance in Java. Here I have a very simple example. I'm saying that we have a class A, we have an interface I, I1 and we have an interface I2. Then you can create a new class B saying that this one inherits from A and then this, at the same time it implements one I, interfaces I1 and I2. You can inherit only from one class. That means you cannot have code coming from two different sources. But you can implement as many interfaces as you like. Yeah. Those of you who have programmed in C++, do we have any C++ programmer here? Yeah, then you know that uh, you can inherit from many classes in C++. You can create a new class saying that I'm inheriting from this class, this class and that class. What is the problem with this approach? Super what? Work what? Super, work uh, super is not defined because there are many of them. And also assume that the, bo all these classes that we inherit from contains the same method M. Which one is available in our class? Well, it turns out to be the first one when you are lining them up like here. But in general, uh, uh, inheritance in C++ that, that allows for multiple inheritance is much more complicated. There are more complicated rules for how it works. Java has simplified it and said you can only inherit from one superclass. Uh, <coughs> constructors. I have a class person uh, coming with a uh, name and an age and I have a constructor that initializes the name and the age like this. And then in the subclass student that extends person, uh, a student is a person but it also comes with a student ID. So in order to initialize a student I need a name, an age and a string student ID here. Uh, here I'm saying that okay, name and age should be initialized using this constructor. So we are initializing it in the same way as we are initializing a person and then I'm saying that this particular field should be initialized in this way. Uh, super, when it's in, inside a constructor, then we are making a call to a constructor in one of the super classes, in the super class. So in this case it means we are initializing our students by starting by initializing uh, the person part using this approach. Uh, 
And this is my uh, complete dictionary example when I squeezed it into one. Uh, so uh, take a look at this one. This is the simplest possible example of inheritance. Uh, it comes together with examples for this course, uh, this lecture. I have a very simple base class uh, book uh, with a few properties. Uh, uh, and then I'm creating a new class dictionary by extending book. So the dictionary class will have these properties, but it will also have these properties. So in order to understand the base class, you must actually look in the super class. And we can do it in more steps. We can have a base class A that inherits B. And we can go on like this. We can have many classes inheriting from this one in this case. So in this case, C comes with the number of properties, but it also has the A properties and the B properties. And the same goes with D. It has the, their own set of properties, but also the B properties and A properties. So when we have an inheritance relation, we form more hierarchies uh, like this one. Yes? Which one is then the super? Is uh, B the super class? A. So it's just the top one always? Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <coughs> As I said, when we are having, <coughs> when we are organized, when we are having inheritance relationship between different classes, in the end they will form hierarchies. This is not an inheritance hierarchy, this is a hierarchy of animals. Uh, I must say this since our university is named after a Swedish scientist called Carl von Linné. Uh, he was the one who divided uh, animals and plants into a hierarchy like this. I think uh, it's used all over the world nowadays, this classification system. Uh, well, the basic idea is that we have subcategories and here in the end we have the concrete animals. For example, we are grouping them together uh, and say that all of these have similar properties, they are a cat. All of these have a similar properties, they are rodent, but they are both mammals and things like this. <coughs> what is a lynx? What? what? Is it a buffalo? <laughs> No, the idea is that by just by looking at its position in this hierarchy, you have a number of you know a number of things about it. You maybe not know what a lynx is, but if you take a look at this part of the three, you can guess that it's got four legs and likes meat, for example, like this. Uh, so, uh, grouping things into a hierarchy like this is actually very good for your understanding. Uh, and we will, by using inheritance relationships like this, we will form, well, sometimes we will form large hierarchies of classes that are related due to inheritance. Uh, so classes, each class describes something uh, specific, but just by looking at its position in the hierarchy, you know a lot about it. So it's a good way of organizing your classes that gives you information about them without reading the code. You just look at their position in the hierarchy and you know a thing about it. Uh, Lynx is in the Swedish lodjur, I think. And we, have, we only have uh, one wild cat in Sweden and it's this one. Um, size like this. It, ate, eat, it likes to eat reindeers. No. <laughs> so it's up in the mountains. I have never seen anyone. Have anyone seen anyone? You have? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are uh, almost extinct. <laughs> uh, when, should we, when should we add a new class to hear our hierarchy? Uh, there is a simple test that I'm recommending. Should I uh, add... I, I need to create a dictionary class. Should I do it by inheritance from a book? Is it a good case to inherit from book. Uh, well, the simplest case is to use the very simple is a test. A dictionary is a book. If you can read the sentence like this, then it is a good candidate for inheritance. 
uh, a bird is an animal, a cat is a mammal, a student is a person, an apple is a pie. If you have two entities that you would like to describe by a class, a book and a dictionary, if you can put is a uh, in between them, then they are likely that inheritance will work. So this is a very simple trick, but it's actually a very good trick. Uh, so <laughs> if you have a rectangle is a graphical object, so this one fits. A triangle is a graphical object, a triangle is a rectangle. Does it sound good? No, a triangle is not a rectangle. So in this case we should have given a graphical object and we should say that uh, a triangle can inherit from graphical object but also a rectangle can inherit from it. But they cannot inherit from each other because they are different entities but they are both, uh, they are both uh, graphical objects. So uh, always use the ISSA test and if the ISSA test fails, don't, uh, I say in general, don't uh, use inheritance. It will only be problematic in the long run. Uh, here I have <coughs> a hierarchy that I'm calling the shape hierarchy. We are talking about graphical objects now. Uh, I, have, uh, I would like to write a program that uh, we should model different graphical objects. We have a rectangle, a triangle and a circle. In order to form, neither of them fits in an is a uh, relationship. But you still have the gut feeling that they are related in some way. What you have to do is in the same way as we did for the animals. You have to insert some category above them. We inserted uh, mammals, for example, as a subcategory and cat as a category. And then you can form a hierarchy. So uh, the idea here is that they are all shapes. Rectangle, triangle and circle, they are all shapes. They all have an X and Y position somewhere on the screen. We can move them, we can ask them what is your current area and we can ask them to print some information about themselves. So when we start to have a number of different entities that are similar but they don't fit using an is a relationship, then we invent something abstract over here and say but they are all shapes. And then we start to move properties. We don't have x and y here, x and y, x and y here. We move uh, them up here and say that they all have in common that they have a certain position. They all have in common that they can answer the question, give me your area. They all have in common that we can move them from one X position to another position like this. So quite often we are describing this, uh, people at the university. We have teachers, we have students and we have uh, TA personnel. Uh, they are not related through an is a relationship. A student is not the teacher and vice versa. But we can often, by introducing an abstract entity here, say that they are all, they are all uh, members of the university or something. So, <coughs> we have introduced an abstraction and that's another key word in Java. We are saying that we have introduced a class, but it's not an ordinary class, it's an abstract class. Public abstract shape. Uh, it is a class, we will never create any instances of a shape because there is no graphical object just called shape. But we will use it to form our class hierarchy. So we are introducing an artificial class called shape. Say that it has an x and y position, it has a constructor initializing the positions. We can update uh, the position using the move method. And we are introducing two methods here saying that it should be able to answer the question give me your area, it should be able to print information for itself. We don't know how to do it yet but it should be able to have this property. So and then we are creating the class rectangle and say it extends shape. By extending shape in this way it gets all these properties and it must then fulfill these two properties. In order to be a shape it inherits these concrete properties and it must implement 
its own version of get area and print information about it. So we have introduced interfaces before. They were purely abstract. It didn't come with any concrete implementation. It just come with a number of uh, abstract methods. Now we are introducing something in between a concrete class and an interface. They are called abstract classes. They come, certain parts of it are executable, but other parts of it are abstract. Do you see the difference? <coughs> so, <coughs> we introduce an abstract class, we move certain parts of the implementation from these classes up to this part here. So, we are saying that everything which is a shape should have an x and y position. We also say that it should have a move method and we provide an implementation for the move method. But then we are into saying abstract methods is get area and print. We don't know how to, how to compute the area in general for an arbitrary shape. But we are saying that all classes that are inheriting from this one must provide a get area method and they must provide a print method. The get area method in a rectangle computes the multiplication of this one for a triangle it's based on this one and for a circle it's based on this one. So they are the abstract clauses are in some way these guys in the hierarchy. Uh, there is no particular animal called a mammal but it defines properties that are common to a large number of different animals. Did we have a question? Yeah, can you use the abstract object if you avoid the abstract methods? You, you cannot you cannot create uh, any in objects of the abstract class. So any try attempts to say new shape will fail. They are only building blocks like these guys that will help you to create concrete classes. Yes? Regarding your ABC example, what is it? Uh, if I see it correctly, you inherit C from B? Yeah. Well, uh, access B from where? From C. Sorry. Yeah, if you're if you're implementing a method in class C, yeah. and you would like to use a method up here, then you, you can say super whatever it is up here. That's, I thought you meant that uh, the A is the super class of this case. No. It's not okay. Uh, if you're, let's make it a bit more complicated. We have an A here with a method M. And we have a class B here also containing a method M. If you're down in class C and say give me method M, it will start to look okay. upwards. If it can't find it here, it will go up here. Okay. Yeah. So <coughs> the abstract classes, uh, uh, an abstract method has no implementation. If a class has one or more abstract methods, it must be declared as abstract. So here we had two abstract methods deciding that everything inheriting from this one should have a get area and print method, but it doesn't provide any implementation of it. If we have an abstract method, we must have an abstract class. The compiler or Eclipse will tell you if you forget it. Uh, <coughs> so uh, these are the helping classes. Uh, often they are not the first thing you come to think about. You are identifying classes you need in your system, but then when you are about to implement and you see the need, I can merge all these classes into one hierarchy if I'm just introducing these abstract classes up here. Uh, <coughs> the nice thing with inheritance is one of, uh, that you can treat them all in the same way. Here I am creating an array of shapes. I said you cannot create shape objects, but you can create an array of shapes, meaning it can contain three different shape objects. I'm adding a rectangle, I'm adding a triangle, I'm adding a circle. They are all inheriting from a shape, that means they are a shape. So we can insert them into the uh, shape array here and then I'm iterating over the uh, array pick them out just as a shape and then I ask them to move somewhere print information about it and print 
its current area. In the first iteration we will get the rectangle and we will move it and we will print information related to the rectangle and its area in this way. So they are all shapes, they are all inheriting from shape and we can treat them as shapes. And if we decide not to look at the finer details here, we can treat them as shapes, all of them. So this is the nice thing with <coughs> with inheritance. Uh, you save a bit of code by inheriting, but more importantly is that you can treat different objects in a uniform way. You can treat students as, as campus and remote students and different types of students. You just treat them as students. They, are, they belong to different classes, but you can treat them in a uniform way. In one of your exercises in the first assignment you will do a system for a ferry and a ferry contains, can contain a large number of different vehicles, a lorry and buses and cars. You will have one class for each type of a vehicle, one class for a car and lorry and bus, but you should in many ways be able to treat them just as vehicles. Uh, so many of the methods for the ferry will be embark a vehicle and you should be able to add whatever vehicle you have. So this is the nice property with inheritance that you can treat them in a uniform way. So <coughs> superclasses in our hierarchies, the one at the top is often an abstract class. Also interior nodes in the in hier hierarchy are also often abstract classes. We have concrete classes as leaves in the lowest level. Uh, fields and concrete members in these abstract classes represent properties and behavior that are identical in all subclasses. Abstract members represent expected behavior of all classes. Uh, Concrete members represent identical behavior. I said they all have a position and you can move from one position to another using the move method. It is identical no matter whether you have a rectangle, a triangle or, or a circle. Uh, the abstract members represent expected behavior from all the sub-club classes. We are, by introducing abstract methods, get, area and print here, we are saying that we expect every subclass of shape to be able to answer this question. What is your area? And print the information about yourself. We don't know how to do it. It will be done differently in the different subclasses, but they are all able to answer uh, this question. Well, let's take a break. Uh, well, yeah, I have tried to describe uh, inheritance, uh, how you are implementing it, how you can create a new class from another class. Uh, so why inheritance? Well, first of all, uh, code reuse. We can simply avoid typing the same code many times. We type the code once in an abstract class and then we let all the other classes inherit this code. So we can save a bit of typing. That's called call reuse. <coughs> Behavior reuse. We can introduce a method in a superclass, get area, and let all the other ones inherit this behavior. They are in not inheriting the exact code, but they, inhabit, they are inheriting the behavior, being able to answer the question, what is your area? Organization. Uh, I try to with the animal say that if we are organizing our code into a hierarchy, it simplifies the understanding of the system. If you have a class hierarchy, it is often you don't have to look at the code just by looking at its position in this hierarchy, you know what the code is doing. Exploit commonalities. As I said, uh, you can treat them all as shapes. Uh, they are different type of objects, but we can say that they are all shapes and we can start to treat them as, as a shape. Extendability. It is often simple to add a new entity to a class hierarchy. For example, an ellipse uh, or a square to the shape hierarchy. Where should we add the ellipse? What? Under circle. 
under a circle. A circle is a shape, an ellipse is a circle. Kind of. Ah, not really. Where should you add the circle? Yeah, we should actually insert ellipse here and then put circle beneath it. A circle is a special type of an ellipse. An ellipse is a shape. And the square, it could be added down here. A square is a rectangle. So often if you have a class hierarchy and you would like to add a new entity to it, it's often rather straightforward. You find its position. You add it there and you only have to add maybe one or two specific methods for this class. Most of the code in this new class is inherited from other classes. So <coughs> there are plenty of advantages of using inheritance. However, it takes a bit of time to get used to. Uh, <coughs> a questionable approach. Reuse a list to implement a set. By set here I mean a data structure uh, which is more like a mathematical set. You know what a mathematical set is? A mathematical set often are depicted as A, B, C. They have a set that contains three elements A, B, C, but they don't have any position or ordering. They are just a bag of different elements. And it also has the properties that you cannot have two B do two Bs into the set. They don't have any duplicate elements. It's another type of data structure. And it's rather easy if you have a list. Here I have a very simple list implementation. And you would like to create a set. All you would have to do was to change the behavior of the add method. You said if it, if it doesn't contain n, then we are adding it in the same way as we do here. That's the only change I would have to do. May just make sure that it doesn't con uh, contain any duplicate elements. However, from, a simp from saving time and from uh, simplifying your implementation, this might be considered as a good idea. But the is a test fails. A set is not a list. Uh, they don't fit together like a triangle and a rectangle. They don't fit together. And in that case, you shouldn't do it. This conceptual relationship is a test uh, shows is important. If you start to use inheritance only for saving a few lines of code, then your class hierarchy will be a mess. It will not contain any information. It will not contain any organization that will help you in the long run. So uh, only use inheritance when there is a test fits. That's my good advice. They should be relate related not only by code but also in concept uh, in a certain way in order for inheritance to make use. The object class. Java comes with a library class called object. This one is a very special class. This is the root of all class hierarchies. That means everyone is inheriting from the object class. We are often writing something like this, but actually it looks like this in the implementation. Everyone is inheriting from the object class. And the object class comes with a number of methods. Equals, get class, to string, clone. That means whatever class you are writing, they always have an equals method. They always have a class. So uh, the, the object class contains methods and properties that all classes, no matter how you construct them, have in common. You can, I think I have an example in here. I have an extremely simple class here called number. It only comes with one field num and a constructor when we are providing this field with a value. It doesn't come with any methods at all, but still I can create a number and ask it give me a string. I can create another number and ask is it equal to the other one. And I can clone it and get a copy of it like this. So the object class is 
We are often writing hierarchies, but you should always think that we have the object class up there. All, all, your, ob all your classes are inheriting from objects. They are all objects in some way. That means if you go to the Java library <coughs> and take a look at the object class, you will see it comes with a number of methods that gives you in some way a default behavior for equals to string and then a few other methods. So you don't have to implement them, but if you are not implementing them, uh, you will get a default behavior. Two objects are equal if they are uh, the same object. Then only the, in that case it will return true. If you are asking it to print itself, Here uh, I'm creating a number object, I'm asking it to print information about itself. It will give you the name of the class and something related to its memory address or something like this. They always have a, the two string can always be used, but often it doesn't give you the information that you're interested in. It gives you some kind of default information. When we are cloning something, what is the default behavior? If you take an object and then you, you can say clone yourself, what will you get? Another object. Another object of the same class having exactly the same field values is what we will get. So it will create a new object and copy the current field values into the new one. So it, it's a clone of it. It's a new object but having the same state, you can say. Yeah. Quite often we are not pleased with the default behavior. Yeah. So here I have my example, a class point. It comes with an x and y coordinate. We have a constructors and get methods here. What I'm doing here when I'm writing to string here is that I'm overriding the default behavior in the object class. The object class contained a method called to string that was returning a string. And what I'm doing here is that I'm providing exactly the same signature in my method. Then I'm replacing uh, the, the default behavior with my own behavior in this case. The same here for equals. Uh, the equals method by default uh, compared if it was the same object. Here I'm saying that no, two points are equal if they have the same x and y coordinates. So once again the object class had defined a number of methods down here. I'm replacing them with my own functionality. And in order to do this replacement, you must have exactly the same signature here. Then you are replacing the default behavior inherited from the, from the object class. Yes? Uh, even if you change the uh, access, well, the public or private, you change the uh, I, You can. I think you can narrow down. Uh, you cannot extend it. I'm not sure <laughs> about this one actually. Uh, can, you, can you write dot override before the signature? Can I write? Dot override. Yeah, no, I will show it. I think you're, you are talking about this one. Yeah. <laughs> In order to save space in my examples, and uh, I'm lazy and uh, sometimes also, uh, I don't do it the proper way. The proper way to override the behavior in one of the superclasses is to use the annotation override like this. This is a new feature in Java, we haven't seen it before, but this is an instruction to the compiler saying it should verify that there exists one of these guys. If you write override and you misspell to string here, then the compiler will say there is no such class to, uh, method to override. So every time you are replacing one method that was defined up here with a new method down here, you should write uh, override, use the annotation override like this. Then you are explicitly saying I am replacing the behavior in the subclass with a new behavior down here. And if you have misspelled it here somewhere, the compiler will say, no, you have not replaced it at all. You've introduced a new method. Probably not your intention, but so. Yeah. 
When you are replacing behavior in the superclass by overriding it, use the annotation override. Uh, so, in the point class here, I am overriding the two-string method and I'm overriding the equals method. I am replacing the default behavior inherited from the object class by my own version of it here. It should be printed like this and two points are equal if they have the same x and y coordinates. Then I can later on use this one. I create an array list of points and I'm adding a number of points here. Uh, let's see. Here I'm iterating over all the points in the list and I'm just printing it here. I'm just inserting it into the print statement. This one calls the toString method implicitly. So it will use our new toString method and it will print them uh, like this. Also, if I'm asking the list do you contain this point? It will say OK, because I have replaced the contains method are using the equals method to recognize if they are equal. And it will see that yes, I have a 5, 4 up here. So it will return true in this case. Uh, so quite often the first thing you should do in a class, I think, is to override the default behavior. And if you're overriding the two-string method or the equals method, you should use, you should not be lazy. You should insert override uh, like this. Then the compiler will verify that yes, we are actually overriding something uh, in this case. Uh, <coughs> polymorphism is a tricky word, but it actually means that at a certain point, I cannot look at this line and code and say which method is executed. Which method is executed here? I don't know whether it's the move method in triangle, rectangle and shape. Uh, the same code, this particular call here, we are asking one of the shapes to move to a certain position. Uh, it can be in one iteration, it can be the move method in rectangle. In another iteration, it can be the move method in the triangle. That means from now on when we have inheritance, I cannot just read the code and say, okay, here I will jump to this particular well-defined point. It will always depend on what is the particular object inside this one at this particular moment. Then I know where to jump. But in general, Polymorphism and, object and inheritance introduces some kind of ambiguity in our code. It is not at that easy to follow it any longer. I don't know which move method and which print method is executed. I cannot go and see what will happen. It will be, depending on what iteration we have, it will be different move and print methods that are, that are called. Uh, also, how do you, we are saying, now we have this, we have this class hierarchy. We have A at the top, B inherits from A and C inherits from B. This is this scenario here. Then, without any problems, I can have a variable of A and assign it a B value. This works because this variable it expects it, it, that we should assign it something that has this property. It can handle the A properties. If we give it a B, it's okay. B can do anything that A can do. So the A variable will not be disappointed here receiving something that uh, is not up to running. So uh, if you have a variable of type uppercase A, you can give it a B value and a C value like this. Because a B is an A, a C is an A. Uh, downcasting. <coughs> uh, a can take a C here, but what we are trying to do here is to assign something that statically is an uppercase A into B. In general, this will not work. Uh, I am try I have a variable of this type. No, I have a variable of this type. And I try to assign it an A value. This one cannot do all the things that a B class can do. 
So it will not work. In this particular case, it will work since uh, the value assigned to this variable is a C, so I can squeeze it in uh, in this way. But think of them that a variable here, it you can assign to it anything that can handle these properties. It must be an A or something that can do all the things an A can do. That means it can be an A or those that can do all the things of an A can do. That's the general idea. The null value fits everywhere. Uh, you can assign null to everything. Uh, I showed it in the equals in the point class, but uh, we have an operator in Java called instance of. It is used like this. You can ask a class, do you belong to a certain class? I can ask variable A, are you an instance of class C? It will be true in this case. Also, if I ask it, are you an instance of class B? It will also be true because a C is, C is a B, uh, like this. So the instance of operator are basically all only used in if statement. And when you're picking out, for example, shapes from a shape array and you would like to find out whether this particular object is a rectangle or a triangle, then you use the instance of operator. It's basically to identify what particular shape it is. You can ask, you can pick them out and ask uh, if you are a triangle, if you, this is an instance of triangle, I would do something, otherwise I would do something else if it's a rectangle. So the instance of operator gives you the possibility to ask a particular object, do you belong to this class? That's it. True or false? So here, in the equals method, when I should compare two points, the first thing I start to do is to check that, well, is this a point at all? I'm asking, if you're, if, is the in parameter object an instance of point? If it is not a point, then I can say, no, they are not uh, identical. They are not uh, equal. If it is a point, I cast it into a point and then I compare, do you have the same x and y coordinates like this? Did you understand what I was doing? The, ob the equals method allows us to compare our point with any other object. So the first check we do is to see if it is a point. If it's not a point, well then they can't be equal. And if it is a point, then we are converting it or casting it into a point and we are asking do you have the same x and y coordinates like this. So the instance of operator are quite, we are, we are using it quite often to identify what type of object we have. Polymorphism. Here I have an example. I have a class A containing a method M. I have a class B extending A that also has a method M and a class C that extends A and also has a method uh, M. So they all form a hierarchy and they all contain a method M. I create an A uh, uh, array here and I insert an A, B and C object and then I'm iterating over it and I'm calling the method M. Which method is called? Is it the type here that decides that we should use this method or is it the object here that decides we should use this one or this one or this one? The it's the object that decides. So when our code is reaching this point in the first iteration, uh, the, the execution will stop for a very short while and it will check what is the actual type of this object that I'm referring to right now. It will be in the first iteration an, an A object. Then it will look up and call this method. In the next iteration it will also stop and it will check what is the object type for this one. It will be a B. Then it will take a look in B and say okay 
I'm executing this method. Yeah. This is the binding process. At runtime, we should when at runtime everything every time we are making a call, we must using some rules to define which is the method that should be called at this particular point. And it's based on the object we have here. It's called the binding process. It's one of the th things that make object-oriented programs a tiny, tiny bit slower than some other languages, because they often have to st stop for a while and decide where to go next. And look up some table and see where to go next. Uh, <coughs> We are saying that we have static or dynamic binding. And a variable also has a static type and a dynamic type. This is just terminology for object-oriented languages. But anyway, we have this hierarchy. Uh, this one. Uh, I'm uh, here ha having a, a variable uppercase A and I assign it an A object. At this particular point, the static type for A, it is the declare type, it is uppercase A, but also the dynamic type for A is A. The dynamic type is what is the current value, what is the type of the current value. Here I assign it a B object, the static type for the variable A is still A, it's the declared to be this way, but the dynamic type is B. So a variable have two types, the declared type that we have declared it to when we are introducing it and it has also a dynamic type which is the value of the, the current, the type of the current value that it stores. And it is this one in Java that decides where to, which method to call in a call situation. Static binding. A call is resolved using the static type of A. That means we know already at compile time which is the target method to call. Since the, the static type is the declare type. Dynamic binding. Uh, <coughs> the call target is resolved using the dynamic type of A. That means we can only decide where to jump next at runtime. It's slightly bit slower. Java are using uh, dynamic binding in all non-static calls, the languages C sharp and C++, they use both dynamic and static binding. You can declare a method as virtual and things like this and change its behavior. Uh, they are much more complicated. So, assume we have a method, assume we have a call. In your code, you are calling the method m on this variable. The execution is reaching this point. How does it decide where to jump next? Well, these are the rules. Uh, it looks at the object referenced by aim. Assume that the, this object has of type x. Then it will take a look at the x class and see, do I have any m? method here. If it has an M method, then we are calling this one. Otherwise, it will look upwards. It will go up in the hierarchy and say, do we have an M method here or do we have an M method uh, over here? It will look upwards in the class hierarchy until it finds a method with a suitable uh, signature. I try to do an example here to show how it works. I have class A, B and C, uh, like this. In class A, I have methods print, write, and scrive. In B, I have print and write. And C, I only have print. So it looks like... Up in A here, we have print, write, and scrive. Scrive is uh, write in Swedish. This one only got print and write. And the class C down here only got print. And then we have a... So this is the situation in our code. And then we are creating a C object and then we are calling uh, print on this one. Uh, 
the rules up here says that we will stop for a while, take a look what is the current what is the current what is the type of the object stored in this one? It will find that it is a C object. Then it will go to the C class and see do we have any print method here? Yes, we have, then we are executing this one. Uh, I'm calling write on this one. It will stop for a while, take a look what is the object. It is a C object. It will go to the C class and see do we have any write method here? No, we don't have. Then it looks upwards and it finds this one. So it will be the B write method that is called in this case. And then it goes on like this. Do you understand how it works? So it is in any code, it is the current object type of this one that decides where to go. Not the declared type, it is the current value stored in this one that decides where to jump uh, next in the code. Questions about the inheritors? Uh, I have presented a number of rules and uh, properties here. It will take you a bit of time to uh, get used to it, but uh, we have a few exercises. I think you will figure it out after a few, after a few problems, I guess. Yes, a question? Speak louder, please. You can have a modifier called protected, yes? Yeah. In, in the book they discourage from using that because they say it has the same like risks of not encapsulating the data. What do you think about that? They say you should not use it, it's breaking encapsulation or what? Yeah, yeah, I think I understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, we should go back here somewhere. Didn't we have an example? Here. Uh, I said here that if you're declare if you're introducing fields up here and make them protected, you can use them from the subclass, but in some way it is breaking the encapsulation. What should be the proper way of doing it if you want to make sure that these objects always have the same have the correct um, behavior and behavior, correct properties. Yeah, we could, we could have made these ones private, preventing direct access from down here, and introduced set X and set Y methods. So we can always check that they are always uh, in a correct state in that way. So uh, I agree with the author of the book saying that we are breaking encapsulation by introducing protector. We can avoid it by introducing methods giving us access to them in a more controlled uh, way. Yeah? Uh, but still, using protected actually uh, treats, it, uh, treats the field as private unless uh, for classes that say uh, this extends. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so I use protected. If I'm the one implementing the system, in some way I am the architecture of both these classes. I am supposed to use them in a correct way. So the subclasses are, the subclasses are in many cases considered to be close relatives to this one. They are to be trusted. But uh, as you said, we can avoid it by introducing pub private ones. Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. And I think on another slide there was a variable uh, declared as private and um, we call it in the sub sub method and um, use the call on the public method. So that's another way to do it. Uh, I'm not sure, but you say that we have a private something up here yeah. and it was still used down here. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's the preferred way if you want to be absolutely sure. Yeah, a few words about the exercises.
Yeah. Uh, the practical meetings. Yeah. Once again, we have divided you into three groups. <coughs> we have the Kalmar and distance students. They have their first practical meeting on Friday. We have the English group starting on Thursday. We have two computer rooms. We will have two teaching assistants dividing you in two uh, halves. And the same goes with the Swedish. You have your first practical meeting on Wednesday. And of course, bring your laptop if you have one. Uh, we have uh, two exercises related to inheritance. Uh, one is an, what I think easy to getting started with. We are providing you with a with an abstract superclass called int collection. It comes with a number of methods and properties that are suitable for uh, data structures. And your task will be to implement one list and one stack. And of course you should try to do it by reusing as much possible of the information up here in the abstract class. You should only add the things that are not already available here. So this one comes with support for iteration and things like this. Uh, all you have to do is to add a few list specific methods down here and stack specific methods down here. So we give you the starting point and you should add uh, two classes that are inheriting from this one and performs this one should be a list and this one should be a stack. Uh, the second exercise is actually much harder. <laughs> you should create an administrative system for a ferry and the ferry should be transport passengers and vehicles and the vehicles are cars, buses, lorries and bicycles. They are a perfect class hierarchy here. You should form your own uh, vehicle hierarchy. This one is the abstract uh, superclass and you should have car, bus, lorry and bicycle as different ones. And the ferry is not the part of this uh, hierarchy. This is the one uh, that uh, it has space for 200 passengers and 40 cars and you should be able to embark different vehicles and disembark with different vehicles and you should always be able to ask the ferry do you have more? Do you have space enough to take another lorry or something like this? Yeah. Yeah. This is just a, a small piece of the instruction. The instructions are rather lengthy, so read the instructions carefully. Remember <coughs> that this is an exercise in inheritance, so you should of course use inheritance to solve the problem. That's all for today. Uh, we take the questions afterwards. Okay. Yeah, thank you and goodbye.